CNBC's Talk Weekend is on the air from 7.30 p.m. till dawn, the only place for continuous talk television Friday through Sunday. John McLaughlin. And Talk Live, featuring guest hosts from around the country, live guests, and your phone calls. CNBC's Talk Weekend, right here, right now. The Hollywood Outsider. In a 30-year career, he has been handcuffed to Robert De Niro, spent months in bed with Ellen Burstyn, deserted Jeannie Berlin on their honeymoon, crashed into King Kong's leg, and traded quips with Johnny Carson and David Letterman. He's also tangled with network censors, been shafted by movie studios, and refused to knuckle under to the Hollywood elite. He's smart, he's talented, and he has a special gift for the rye sort of comedy and deadpan humor. He's been called show business's best kept secret. What's in store for this smart and talented, multifaceted performer? We'll find out. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome actor, producer, writer, and director Charles Grodin. Direct from Studio 2 at CNBC, McLaughlin, a spontaneous, unrehearsed discussion on today's most interesting issues and personalities. And now your host, John McLaughlin. Uh, Charles Grodin, you're Hollywood's best kept secret, is that right? Is that a compliment or a, an insult? I don't know. It's, it's... Well, you, you, you read that. I just did read it, yeah. <laughs> I, and I read it as though I meant it, didn't and I? You read it as though you knew what it meant. Do you think I meant it, first of all? Uh, no, I think somebody told you that, but you're not sure what it means. Well, you... I'm not sure. In fact, <laughs> I asked the makeup lady because I saw it on the thing. Or like, what, what is that? Is that a, what does it mean, Hollywood's best kept well, secret? Well, what it means is that you're a man of special gifts, but it's not widely, as widely known as one would expect a man with special gifts to be known. So is that a compliment or an attack? Well, it means that you're available to salvage a situation that needs salvaging, that they can rush you in. And you're the emergency equipment that pulls the, the, the movie through, or whatever it is. Like a fireman. Like a fireman, right. Do you, so it's you do any of that work, too? Well, the, or? For the fireman, it's like uh, when, when they did the survey of the most highly regarded profession in America, it was the fireman. Yeah. So I'll take that as a compliment. I think it is a compliment. All right. Do you want to preserve that status and continue to be a secret, or do you want to be known? I don't, I don't know. I mean, it, you know, I'm, I don't really. I live uh, in the East. I don't live in Hollywood, so I don't get out to parties. And for most of, the, most of my life, I haven't had a press agent, and I haven't, you know, been exposed to people as widely known as you. So uh, I'm not, uh, maybe that's why I'm not, uh, I'm, a, I'm a secret. But I think after this show, with, this, with your, your mm -hmm. massive audience, it will be hard to retain that mm -hmm. secrecy. Mm -hmm. What's the most recent film you've done, Charles? Well, you say that as though I've never done a film. <laughs> Is that the McLaughlin style? I did a film on the way over here uh, to this broadcast, as a matter of fact. What was that film called? It's called Beethoven. That's a picture that will be out in, uh, at Easter. Beethoven is, oh, is this Saint about Bernard. the dog? No, it's Saint not about Bernard. the dog. St. Bernard dog. It is the dog. It is. The dog's name is Beethoven. What's, that, what's it all about? It's about a, uh, a, a little puppy that escapes from a, a ring that wants to do animal experiments and wanders into my household. Are you going to take a nap or what? No, I just saw that. It's like a deep heavy, side. Heavy heavy breathe. Breathe. <laughs> you asked the question. <laughs> now, how come that's been so slow in being released? That that we just finished that. We just finished the picture at the end of July, John. Oh, I mean, you know, you have to like put it together, and it could have come out at Christmas, but they wanted to come out at Easter. They they tested the picture, and it tested higher than. Just bear with me, John. This isn't that long. An what answer. about this? Just a second, John. Let me just finish the yeah. answer. Uh, <laughs> uh, they they uh, they, they tested the picture. You, said, you know, you ask a question, you have to. <laughs> you know how it goes. Uh, I've got a, a low bottom threshold. I understand, but, but, don't, but ask questions that require one-word answers, then you'll be, uh, I mean, you know, are you warm, minutes, are you cold? Uh, you've got 90 minutes out of a relationship that you had with a dog, is that it? This picture tested higher. That Ivan Reitman is the producer of this movie. Ivan Reitman produced Ghostbusters and directed it. Twins, Kindergarten Cop, Animal House. Uh, this picture tested higher than any of those pictures. 
and it'll be out at Easter. At that point, John, I won't even speak. To Do you him. think it's going to salvage? Uh, it's going to salvage your acting career in the in the wake of taking care of business. Well, taking care of business actually was a successful picture. It was. Yeah, it was a successful picture. It wasn't as as big as Disney would like it to have been. But so it was a box think, office success. Uh, well, it, you know, when you talk about box well, office, I you have to talk about. I want to get serious with you for a minute. That's I am on, serious. on the matter of ratings. It's got a stu two star rating from a a critic at the San Francisco Chronicle whose name is Mike LaSalle. He says, taking care of business has a mean spirit, no brain, and might be the worst comedy I've seen all year. It's certainly the worst featuring legitimate stars in a picture that costs more than a buck and a half to make. Even the look of the film is off. It's grainy and cheap looking, but then, if you want to complain about this movie, you can start out anywhere. Praise, however, have to begin and end with mentioning the performance of Charles Grodin as a finicky advertising executive named Spence Bonds. Yeah, I think that's a great review. You do? Yeah. What was that last part you said? <laughs> you like that. That's what I call a rave. Now, the picture did well despite the review. The about $20 million at the box office. Now, how, well, much, brought, money, how much money have you ever taken in the box office? What does it cost to make? Office, about 15 but the box You've got to make three times the cost of the film before you even uh, even not, recover not, your full not, cost. Not really. That, that used to be before the set market and all those other things. It, it's a it's a successful picture. It's not what they'd hoped it would be. You wrote a book called uh, It Would Be Nice If You Weren't Here. It would be so nice if you weren't here. Look, it's right in front of you. It would you be so, it, it'd be so nice if you weren't here. And in this book... <laughs> Anybody can get their own show. You can't they? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody who can't read titles straight can. It, you wrote a book, and in this book you complain. Uh, you I don't com think so. You complain from the heart about the way, the power that reviewers have, notably a review that was done in Variety. Do you remember your account of that? Yes, I do, John. What was the connection? It was a picture I wrote and uh, and co-produced and played a leading role in called Movers and Shakers. And uh, oh no, you're talking about another picture. You're talking about a picture I made in 1974. Did you want to read this book? Why don't you take a look at this book? No, I know the picture you're referring to, but I'm waiting for the commercial. Okay. <laughs> when we come back, I want you to tell me about the power of reviewers and the unfairness of reviewers and what it can do to a person's career. We'll be right back with Charles Grodin's resume when we return.
You recognize those stills, Charles Gray? I do, yes. Would you care to cite the mo motion pictures? Well, I, I, you want me to remember what each one was? Oh, just give us one. was that. a picture with Albert Brooks. It was his first picture called Real Life. And another one was a picture with Steve Martin called The Lonely Guy. And uh, under advice of counsel, I don't wish to speak. <laughs> <laughs> a little memory, <laughs> a little memory collapse there. Well, you can't show them and then like take them off and say what was that. I mean, it's there, it's like a test here. Let's go back to Variety. All right. Variety did a review of you, and you recalled during the break the motion picture that was mentioned in your in your book in your Vadi Makem. Sixteen years ago. Sixteen years ago. Yes. Eleven Harrow House. That right? was that was very mean of you. Uh, Eleven Harrow House. That's right. You did that motion picture with Candace Bergen. Yes, yes, I did. Yes. Now, what did Variety say about the film? I uh, I refuse to answer on the grounds that it might incriminate me. It's the reviewer said he hated the film, right? What were the consequences of that? On advice of counsel, I refuse to answer that question. <laughs> the, the, the consequences of that film is I didn't work in pictures for a couple of years. Uh, the consequences of that review? Yes, because, really? the, the, because I was the main star of the picture and it didn't make money and uh, most people didn't see the picture, they read the review and they said it would be sad to think that an acting career lay ahead. And the next year I went to Broadway and starred in a play called Same Time Next Year and uh, won a Best Actor Award, so it'd be, it wasn't so sad to think that an acting career lay ahead. Um, does Variety pack that kind of punch? In the case when the audience or the industry doesn't see the movie, they would just believe what Variety says or what that particular critic says. Did other critics like Eleven Harrow House? Eleven Harrow House got mixed reviews and it was okay. It was a modest uh, failure, I would say. Do you think that movie reviewers are sometimes assigned to do a hatchet job on some motion picture or star? No. I think that sometimes there's a predisposition because, for example, in the case of Ishtar, when they incorporate the budget of the picture, the $50 million Ishtar, the people are predisposed not to like and to review the budget more than the picture. But I don't think anybody intend, no critic would intentionally come out and want to attack a picture or a star. And play. you don't think editors or publishers uh, assign reporters to do that type of savage Well, treatment? I do have a play called Price of Fame that is the next picture I'm going to do where a, a, uh, an interviewer is assigned a hatchet job from a magazine to do a hatchet job on a, on a movie star. But that's not a reviewer. I do think that sometimes people are assigned to go get somebody, yes. And you've seen that in print? I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. It has never happened to me. It's happened with friends of mine. Can you think of one particular friend who was victim of a hat? Yes, yeah. there was a director named Claudia Weil, and a, uh, the Daily News assigned a woman writer. I think her name was Jeannie Allen. I think that's her name. And she uh, was assigned to go get, get this woman director, a woman writer, and the headline was tough, ambitious, and looking for a hit. And she went after this woman director because they were, so they thought it'd be interesting to go get this kind of, and the woman was hardly tough, ambitious, and looking for a hit. She directed a picture that I was in, and a lovely, uh, a lovely person. And uh, so it, it just makes good copy, and sometimes they do that. They criticized her for, among other things, for spending $200 for a birthday present for her mother. These were one of the sins that she, uh, she committed. But when you really try to come down to what did she actually do that would be so heinous, they were really, like, left... Let's talk about one of your brilliant uh, successes called Midnight Run, which stands out among your film credits. It was both a cr critical and a commercial success. It proved to be an excellent vehicle for your talents. Let's take a look. Would you mind opening the register? Oh, don't touch them. Excuse me. Contract two, Hank. Check them out. Give him a pencil, please. Do the litmus configuration. You're doing the litmus configuration? Litmus configuration. Yes. yes. This one's bad. Would you describe exactly what the last man who passed a $20 bill to you looked like? 30, tall. About six feet tall? Six five. Dark brown hair. Light colored. Sounds like our man. That's him. 
We're gonna have to take these bills for evidence. Think of a receipt. This one's bad, too. This one's bad. What's the name of your establishment? Red's Corner Bar. Are you Red? Yes, sir. You dye your hair? No. Why do they call you Red? Oh, it's short for Red Wood. But my last name's Wood. What's your first name? Bill. Thank you for your cooperation, Bill. <laughs> yes, yes, doctor. What uh, heinous comment are you going to offer now? Uh, what's your biggest recollection, your strongest recollection from Midnight Run? You want to uh, think about it some more? We're going to take a break in four seconds. Charles Grodin, we're going to talk to you later about... What's your strongest recollection from Midnight Run, the clip that we just saw? Well, we were, uh, in, in the picture, we have to be taken down the rapids. We jump into a river to escape, and uh, right. we go down the rapids. And we, uh, I always uh, believe that if anyone's going to ask me to do something uh, that seems dangerous, that somebody has tested it, and that there's no real jeopardy. So I just walk down to the edge of a cliff, and they say, we're going to take you out in a boat and lure you over the side and you thrash around for a while, and uh, as though uh, bullets are shooting at you. I said, 
Okay, and I have a wetsuit on underneath my regular clothes over my overcoat, and I assume that they know what they're doing, and they take me out of boat. It's Arizona in January. Arizona sounds like a warm place, but it was the water was 40 degrees, a little bit more than 40 degrees, and they drop me over the side and just start to sink. There was no, the water, the coat got so waterlogged so quickly that I just start to sink. Wow. So they said, you know, wave if there's any, uh, so I waved very quickly, and, uh, and they got me out of there. We ended up having to go to New Zealand to shoot that sequence because it was too, the water, water would have killed us. We couldn't have uh, stayed in there. I remember that. I remember that scene. Then you went to a rock uh, and you climbed and you climbed up on the rock, but De Niro was clinging to the rock, and that's when you cut your deal with De Niro. Do you remember that? Yeah, I think so. I helped him out, and then you um, helped him out. I helped. I helped him out. Yeah. yeah. Now there's a there's a larger question there, and that is the behavior of directors, and whether directors get so caught up in their own vision that they become almost frenzied or manic, and they will tell the actors to do this, this and to do that without regard to the safety of the actor. Well, this director, who's kind of a slight fellow named Marty Best, a brilliant director, he directed Beverly Hills Cop and uh, Going in Style. He's a very very gifted director. But he's a very, very slight fellow. He said, I will never ask you to do something that I wouldn't do myself. So when we came out for the rapids in New Zealand, I said, you know, Marty, what, what, how do I know if I let myself, and there's no ropes or anything, you actually are going down the rapids. How do I know there aren't some rocks under there? And he said, well, you know, we're not 100% sure. And he said, well, do you want me to do it? And I said, no, I'm not interested in seeing you get hurt either. But when we got there, just to show me, he, he went in a boat and he got on the side of the rock and he let himself come in the ra rapids and the rapids washed him down and he got out, that, which is what I was supposed to, he got out and he threw his arms in the air and everybody applauded plotted and as if to say okay now I can do it and he later told me that for the rest of the day he thought he was going to faint <laughs> he could barely stand up for the he did it and at that moment he was all right but the rest of the day it just took so much out of him to be actually in the rapids but de niro way. also became a little bit frenzied because in your book you describe how de niro when he was handcuffed to you he pulled you and he exacted from you physical pain in a variety of different circumstances Do you remember that the first day of shooting uh was there was a scene that doesn't end up in the movie but that's not in the movie but he was i was supposed to be pulled down the street I'm handcuffed behind my back. There's three ways you can do that. I can either put my hands behind my back, the camera's where you are, so you don't see what, if I'm handcuffed or not, or they have plastic handcuffs, or they have real steel handcuffs. So I said, look, it's dark. It's 3 o'clock in Brooklyn Heights here. I said, why don't I just hold my hands behind my back? The director said, just to make sure that it looks right, let's put the plastic cuffs on so we, we're sure that the angle of your shoulder is right. And De Niro says, if you wouldn't mind, how about putting the steel cuffs on? Well, it's dark and my hands are behind my back, but it's the first day I'm working with him, and it's some kind of a mano a mano test there, I feel. <laughs> so I say, all right, right, I'll put the handcuffs behind my back. Well, after about two hours of this, my wrists are bleeding, and he says, uh, you all right? And I say, yeah, I'm all right. I'm fine. You know, that was our first day. It was a kind of like a little test of how far we would go, but I was going to go as far but as we needed pulled, to go. Didn't he pull you underneath a... Truck. A truck? Yeah. With yeah. your handcuffs yeah. on him? Yeah. Yeah, you take a little bit of a beating. Well, what did you think of working with De Niro? I love working with him. Why? Because he'll, he'll work as hard as you want to work. And I like to work, uh, I like to go over things a lot, and I like to work at it, and, and he'll, he'll just stay with you as long as you want to. So uh, I like working with him. Now, he's a favorite of Martin Scorsese. All right. Right? Right. Scorsese thinks that De Niro is a really gifted act, and he loves, to, he loves to direct him. Right? Everybody thinks that De Niro's a, a very gifted actor. He is, of course. Yeah, he's, come, he's got a new movie out with Scorsese That's called right. Cape Fear. Have you heard of that? Yes, I have heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen it? No, I have not seen it. <laughs> All right, is De Niro as good as Scorsese says he is? I think De Niro's as good as Scorsese says he is. He yes. is? Yes. Have you, ever seen, have you ever seen De Niro do a lousy job or a lousy scene? Or an inferior scene in no. any movie? No. He's, he's always at peak performance. Now he's always a, a top-notch actor. <clears throat> like you, De Niro lives in New York, New York City. That's right. <laughs> he has not moved to Los Angeles. No, he has not. <laughs> Why? Why hasn't De Niro moved to Los Angeles? Why haven't you with De Niro moved to Los Angeles? Why should we move to in Los fact, Angeles? De Niro has opened up his own production studio in Tribeca, New York. Yes, correct? he has. He has. And yes. a little restaurant there. And he has a restaurant. That's have true. You, have you? 
No, I have not opened a restaurant. Have you opened a production? No, I have not opened a production office at building in Tribeca. <laughs> very funny, very funny. But tell me this. Why, seriously, why do you like New York versus L.A.? Is there, is there a reason? Are you avoiding L.A.? I'm wanted by the police in L.A. <laughs> so I go to L.A. under an alias, I do the movie, and I get right out of there before they can serve me a subpoena. Seriously, why don't you work? Uh, Alan King is another actor who does not, and a comedian who does not... Uh, and another actor that has not opened a restaurant. Nor a production studio. Nor a production but studio. But he would like to do both because he's basically an entrepreneur. There you are. I live here because I prefer breathing. In Los Angeles, there's every other day they tell you there's an alert, you know, don't come outside unless you have to. So I prefer to be able to come outside. Not that it's a great bargain to come outside here. Do you prefer acting in motion pictures to acting on the stage? I don't see that that's any of your business. <laughs> I really think that's an that inappropriate question. You're turning on me, aren't you? I wouldn't say that. When we come back, we're going to talk about you and same time next year, and you doing your own monologue, stage monologue. You remember that, that event? We'll be right back with Charles Grodin, a man of many talents. Love and sex? That motion picture? Did you ever have sex? Why do you ask? No, you said you remember love and sex. I just wondered if you personally oh, wait ever a minute. What had is sex? sex? What is sex? I don't know. You said you remember having sex. I. <laughs> you know, you're older than you look. So are you. <laughs> no, I'm not. Are you, were you a priest? Jesuit. 
What's that mean? Well, that's a long story. Yeah. <laughs> I'll bet it is. All right. Let's get down to this. Uh, you've been an actor on stage, been an actor in motion pictures. You've directed stage productions. You have not directed motion pictures, and you avoid directing motion pictures, I believe. That's, that's right. Is that right? That's right. Why? Why not? <laughs> Why should you? I don't want to. I don't want to like, you know, I, you age right in front of everyone's eyes when you direct a motion picture. What do you it mean? It takes about, about a year to direct a motion picture. Really? And I would, yeah, and I would rather do, I mean, from the pre-production, the production, the post-production, I would rather be free to come here and attack people like you. <laughs> uh, Charles Grodin, tell me about the play same time next year. What's it about? It's about two people who meet every five years, every year. But in the play, you see them every five years. It covers a period of 25 years. What do they do when they meet? They have sex. Aha. Uh -huh. So now we're discovering what it is. That's what's okay. time Okay, now sense. where do they have it? In the bed. And what locale? Big Sur, Monterey, someplace up in that area. Does it vary? Or no, it the it's same? always the same place. Is it a retreat house? No, it's a, it's, it's a resort of some kind. I'll let you know after the show where it is that you can go and have sex there. <laughs> I thought it was a Catholic retreat house. All no, right. No, 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 no. Nothing no? like that. Nothing Some kind like of that. a retreat, wasn't it? And you're not gonna and you're not gonna yeah. say to, you're not gonna say to me, now Charles, you starred in same time next year on Broadway with Ellen Burstyn. You won the Best Actor Award. And yet <laughs> when they made a motion picture, they had Ellen Burstyn and Al Alda starred in the picture. Now, how do you feel about that? That's the kind of question you should ask me. How do you feel about I'll that? never discuss that. <laughs> you were upset at the time. Very upset. I'm still upset. 16 Why years did ago. Alan Alda get that uh, role in the film and you didn't? Because his cousin was the head of Universal Pictures at the time. Who? Lou Wasserman. Wow. Wow. Uh-huh. Mm. Interesting. I've never revealed that on the air. Who? <laughs> Who? <laughs> Who preceded Ellen Burstyn in that role? No one. Ellen Burstyn and I originated the role. Wait a second. No, you wait a second. <laughs> what about Loretta Swit? She followed Ellen ah, Burstyn. Ah, I Ellen saw... Ellen Burstyn and I, what they, what they call, created the roles on Broadway. I saw... And La... she won the Tony. I saw... La... Who did? Ellen Burstyn. I saw Loretta Swit. Did you? She was marvelous. I'm sure she was. Uh, you also have acted, and congratulations, by the way, belated congratulations for having achieved, what, Best Actor Award? That's right. What? At, at the Outer Critic Circle Award. Outer Critic Circle. Thank you. It's about yeah. time. Well, they don't count too much, though, do they? Well, it's only we voted on all the critics in New York outside of New York. There's about 400 of them. Including the New York critics? No, excluding the New York critics. That means like Frank Richards of, of the New York Well, he Times. wasn't reviewing at that time. He wasn't? He is now. Yes, he is. What do you think of his review? I'd rather not answer that. What do you think of the power of his review? Oh, the power of Frank Richards' review? I think it's just making the theater blossom. All the theaters are empty. <laughs> <laughs> you, the man being, likes too many things. Are you being serious? No. You're not being No, I'm not. Do you approve of the power of reviewers of theater? Absolutely not. I don't think there should be reviewers in the theater. They should not be. No. I mean, let the people decide. Yes, it's called it's consumer driven. You put a product out in the market, you put out a quart of milk, do people review it? Or right, people want to see it, they go to see it. Let me try this other line of thought with you. You did a a single person performance. A one man show, they call one it. One man show. It's a single person performance, yes. Right. <laughs> How long have you been a host? <laughs> When was that? 1983 was the first time I ever did it. How long did it run? I, it was one night only. One night? I did it for one night at the Stanley Theater in Pittsburgh, which is my hometown. It was on one night only. I did it for an hour and 20 minutes. I stood on the stage alone. What did you discuss? I talked about getting into show business and the difficulty and then emerging into the multi-talented I am today. Multi talented, what? I'm not going to finish that sentence. Uh, did you enjoy doing that one I'm, night? I'm going to be doing this more and more. I have since done it five or six times, and I'm going to be appearing alone in concert, possibly nightclubs. I have a new book that you're probably aware of called How I Get Through Life. 
It's uh, published in April by William Morrow, and I'm going to do a book tour and probably appear in the various cities okay. and, and annoy people. You know that this form is becoming much more popular. You have a man by the name of Rick Reynolds, yes, I've who heard reconstructed his whole life That's on right. stage, That's which right. I saw for about an hour, and I would say almost 40 minutes, uninterrupted, yeah, no I hear, break. I hear he's very good. It, it, it was a remarkable performance. He was excellent. Yes. But it's also uh, harrowing because he cries on stage, yes. he, he relives emotional experiences yes. of great and rooted uh, impact on yes. his development. Yeah. Uh, Spalding Gray has yes. done it in something called Monster in a Box. Yes. Correct? Yes. Uh, what's it like to do something like that? And, and how much does it take out of you? Or what it's are the a, questions one has to ask? It's a wonderful, what are the questions one has to ask? What does that mean? You want me to tell you what it questions means that you should be asking? You un before you undertake uh, something like this of that, of that dimension, what do you have to think of? What you're going to say for an hour and a half. You have to write the material. You have to do it. It's a great experience because you get to work alone. You don't have somebody standing there and God knows who you are even, <laughs> attacking and assaulting you right and left and reading you bad reviews from 15 years ago. It's a very pleasant experience to work alone. We'll be right back with Charles Grodin. Charles Grodin. Yes, uh, in foul play, 
The one with all the dogs. Did that lead towards your new film? Any? Seems like old times. With, with Goldie Hawn and Chevy Chase, you mean? Well, yeah, with all the dogs. That I seems mean. like old times. What, what was the question? <laughs> the, you know, with all the dogs and all, does that lean towards your new film? You mean because the new dog, the, there's a dog in the new picture? The dogs. <laughs> no, uh, seems like old times, I think, was 1980. And this, this and, and Beethoven was 19. It had nothing to do with it. And, uh, seems like old times was done in 1980. Did two films that year. The other film was It's My Turn. It's My Turn. Right. You've, you've appeared in Catch-22. Stop me if any of these films strike a reminiscent chord. <clears throat> reminiscent means something from the past that is attractive to you. Uh, Catch-22, Heartbreak Kid. In 1974, you did 11 Harrow House with Candace Bergen. How did you enjoy acting with Candace Bergen? <laughs> I noticed you're staring at me, and you lifted an eyebrow. Why is your face going through this contortion? Just wondering where you got your suit. <laughs> is that a wool suit or is that a, like a, is that a lightweight suit? Because I'm so hot with a, with a, with a wool gabardine well, blazer. I just wonder see, if you're The air conditioning is all on this side. It's on that side. On I said, you look so studio. comfortable and I'm yeah. roasting up here. Yeah, that aside, how is Candace Bergen? She's a lovely person and she's very successful, is as she, you know. Is she a good actress? Well, she's, she's like the biggest comedy star on television that today. That doesn't necessarily Brown. mean she's a good actress or does it? Do you interpret good acting to be highly paid actress, no. actresses? No. No? No. She's a good actress. Sure. And her, her, her uh, career right now is, I guess, at its apex. Let's say she's doing a lot better than we are. <laughs> we are right here. No, in general. It's in general. Okay. Then you did King Kong in 76. You did uh, Thieves in 1977. Am I right? And in 1978, you had a big year. You did Real Life, Heaven Can Wait, uh, Just Me and You, uh, and The Grass is Always Greener Over the Septic Tank. That's four films in one year? How'd you accomplish that? Well, you have to get up and go to work every day, basically. And then, but two of those, uh, yeah, that's right. Or four. Is that right? Four films in one four year? Four in 78. I don't know. That was a big year for you. In 79, you did Sunburn. In 80, it just seems like uh, old times, and it's my turn. In 81, you did an incredible shrinking... You know, shrinking people could just buy a book and read this. This isn't what you call interesting television. You're reading an index on cards. Why don't you act like a host and ask an interesting question? <laughs> this in 82, I could read that. What do we even need you here for? In 83, I did Charlie's Aunt, Love, Sex, and Marriage. In 84, I did The Lonely Guy and the Woman. I mean, you know, this is not interesting television. <laughs> Come on, you get paid to do this, don't you? Do something other than read off what, what pictures I did. For God's sakes. What about Clifford? That's not there. Ah, that's good. That's a picture I did with Martin Short, where he plays a 10-year-old boy and it's going to be coming out next year. Now, wait a minute. Martin Short's 40 years of age. And Martin Short is, is, is about, is a little over 40 years. So he's years about of 13 years younger than you are. No, Martin Short is three years older than I am. I'm 37. <laughs> you may look 37. I am 37. You're 53 years of age, no, pal. No, I'm not. How you old were are born you? in 1935. How old are you? Old enough to know better. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. How old are you? Why do you ask? I just want to know if you're too old to do this. <laughs> I think you're too old to do this show. I have to be honest with you. you know, and I don't mean that as age prep. I think you're too old. First of all, are you comfortable standing up that long? <laughs> I mean, all you're doing, you're kind of standing there reading off a card. It doesn't make any sense what you're doing. You've got everything backwards, you know. <laughs> when you do your Sunday morning show, you're sitting, right? Right. They're fine. You like When those. you're standing, I don't think you could stand and ask intelligent questions at the same time. Just a professional opinion of another professional. Let me ask word. you a question. Yes, sir. All right. Yeah. Why do the French like Jerry Lewis? Well, someone likes everyone. What is it about Jerry Lewis? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, Jerry Lewis it was hilarious when I was a kid. And now? I don't see Jerry Lewis uh, very much now. But w w what accounts for taste, particularly your films overseas? What does that mean? It means that I, I believe Midnight uh, Run had a good airing in uh, Yeah, well, like well, well, we do. I don't know what accounts for taste. I mean, you're on the air, right? Right. You've got two shows. Three. Three shows. Right. So what accounts for taste? I mean, I wouldn't believe you could get a job, to <laughs> be honest with you. No, I, I, it's, hard to, it's hard to understand that. I could see you as a priest, but it's hard to see you as a man with three, three shows. Mike Douglas should have three shows. Mike Douglas. You want to resurrect Mike and bring him, bring him back here? 
Let me ask you this question. You are regarded Charles Grodin for reasons that no one can understand as being sensitive. Right. How do you show that sensitivity? Not here. By insulting me? Yes! <laughs> yes. I don't feel as though I'm insulting. I feel like I'm helping you. I'm trying to steer you toward another career. Do you feel stereotyped? No. What does that mean? Do you feel as though you'll always be a character actor and never ri rise to true stardom? I think I have arisen to tr true stardom. What kind of a star are you? Stage? Screen? Television? television? Right. All three? Right. You're a star? What constitutes a star? What is a star? Well, you... I thought I just asked that. <laughs> Can you be a celebrity without being a star? Can you be a celebrity? Oh, boy, bring the music on. Who even understands what you're talking about anymore? You're a professional interviewer? This is outrageous. De Niro, Horn, Tomlin, Beatty will talk about some of Charles Grodin's... I have a question for Charles Grove. Have you ever had any romantic affairs with any of your leading ladies? Yes, I have. I've had uh, sex with uh, several of my leading ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Who? Who? Well, it, it, you know, it wouldn't be right because the ones that I didn't have sex with would probably be offended. So I don't think it's proper to say which. What? That's the Did kind of question I would expect from uh, <laughs> Dr. McLaughlin. From, our, from the doctor. <laughs> The doctors, as we laughingly refer to him, we, the doctor. Do we have another question here? Please stand. What was it like to uh, work with Steve Martin? 
I like Steve Martin very much. He's very clever and he's a very giving person. Um, he, he's the one responsible for me being in that movie because people thought we were too much the same, but he was responsible. See how nice I can answer a question when a nice young gentleman asks me? Watch and see how he what talks. What was the name of the movie you were in? Lonely Guy. Lonely Guy? Yes. Was that the only movie you were in with him? Yes. Is, would you call him a comic actor? I just call him Steve. I don't know. Are there many comic actors? What, I'm not sure what you mean, comic actor. What is a comic actor? I don't know. An actor who plays comedy, is that what you mean? I don't really concern myself too much with a comic, a comedian, a comic actor. You know, there's too many things to do to like. Billy think Crystal about that. is a comic actor. I guess. So. It's more than being an actor. It is. Plays now, you, you are, uh, dis <clears throat> despite your lapses into bad taste, you are regarded as a comic actor. Yes. yes. I guess because I play comedy. God, this is interesting. But you <laughs> you got this deadpan look. Yeah. What are you pointing at me there? <laughs> oh, that's your microphone. <laughs> now, uh, yes. Give me a break. What, is, what do you want? I want, a name, I want you to list five or six good, uh, recognizable film comic actors. You want me to list five or six recognizable film comic actors? I'll give you another one. Albert Brooks. Albert Steve, Brooks. You've already mentioned... Albert Steve. Brooks is great. Stephen Martin. Stephen Martin. Uh, Peter, you want another one? Peter, Peter Sellers. Peter Sellers, deceased. Who else? Robin Williams. Robin Williams. Give me another. Why? Woody Allen. Woody Allen. Have you, have you done anything with Woody Allen? No. He's never asked me to work. He's with him. avoiding you, huh? Yes, he is. Well, that's we met one. That's understandable, and yes. I don't think you should hold it against him. No, I don't. He's bright. Who else? Can you name any others? What? Any other comic, comic actors? Comic actors. Charlie Ch Chaplin, Buster Keaton. You've had the opportunity to work with a great uh, many, and I think we're going to get this. I think we're going to lead into now another piece of film. Many stars, among them Warren Beatty. You work with him twice in the box office debacle, Ishtar. And prior to that, in the successful Heaven Can Wait. Let's take a look. You locked me in a closet. Only for a moment. What did you say to him? I told him you saw a mouse. Oh, my God. Hey, darling, look, look, I'm not very oh good at spur of the moment mouse. alibis. I'm very calm. Uh, I'm not very good. What's the difference he knows anyway? He's probably got enough evidence to lock us away for the rest of our lives. Darling, I don't understand this. I saw him inhale the nose spray. Two full squirts in each nostril. He never really inhaled it, did he? He overheard us somehow. That must have been what had happened to me. Maybe he's got us bugged right now. Maybe everything is recorded. No, no, Why darling. Not? We're he's not being recorded. An electronics expert sweeps the place every day. He's, he's afraid of being bugged too, darling. He's no. playing with us. That's what it is. This is a game. Oh, my God. He's playing a game with us. That's what it is. You locked me in a closet. What? <laughs> Hello. Mr. Farnsworth would like to see you now. Yes, indeed. Yes. Would you excuse me, Mrs. Farnsworth? Yes, of course, Mr. Abbott. Beatty was more than your co-star in that film. He wore several hats. What was it like working for and taking direction from Warren Beatty? You know, Warren told me once that uh, he was reluctant to have me be in the picture because he heard that I was crazy. And I said, why, why would, wh who told you that? He said, I can't remember. I talked to a lot of people. And I said, well, why would you think I was crazy? And he said, because uh, you're an actor, you're a writer, you're a director and a producer. And, there are uh, other reasons, too. And you'd have to be, thank you, you'd have to be crazy to do that. And I said, how do you know? He says, because I am, too. <laughs> Meaning he's crazy? There was actually a joke in there. See, if you don't interrupt <laughs> while I'm talking, you can actually you get the rhythm of the joke. This is why I like to work alone, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> You ever want to come see me, see me stand alone? There's nobody in the middle. You're going to the punchline, and this guy says, ah, nah, nah, nah. What? What? You know, so you throw off the rhythm. You yeah. think the good work. You think, think the bloom is off uh, Warren's rose? Well, L Warren's last picture took in $100 million at the box office. Which one was that? Dick Tracy. Uh, that much? Yes. I, we did a show uh, within a few hours from the time we're doing this show, and uh, everyone on the, the four, the four uh, critics on the show panned uh, Dick Tracy. It was a box office success. Yeah, very, very successful. And he's coming out with another show. Called Bugsy. Bugsy. Yes. You predict the success for that? Yes. What else do you predict? I, I predict that I'm going home as soon as this show is over. <laughs> you got to put a question to this gentleman, if you can, you know, strain the, strain the semantics. Go right what was ahead. the funniest thing that ever happened to you in a movie? You mean in the script or, or yeah, not like in the script? Yeah, while you were filming a movie the or The funniest anything? thing that ever happened to me? Yeah. 
Nothing that funny happens. I mean, it's work. You work like 14 hours a day. It's really not that funny. It's just, it's really hard work. Uh, can you tell us something about the other co-stars you've worked with? I'll run through a list. We've discussed Beatty. What about uh, Walter Matthau? Walter Matthau has the unique ability to move parts of his face separately. He really does. You mean he, left he cheek can, versus yeah, right cheek? Yeah, that's right. He can move just, certain, you know, like they, they, on King Kong, they could move parts of his face mechanically, but Walter does it, you know, with his own, with his own muscles. Sybil Shepard. Sybil can move parts of, uh, of her uh, area below her face <laughs> independently. She can move a breast, for example, without moving the other breast. She's the only actress that I ever worked with that's capable of doing that. Oh, Lily, Lily Tomlin. Lily cannot move any part of her body unless, uh, unless she has like a good breakfast in the morning. Uh. Do you remember any other vignettes about any other actors? I remember nothing at all. I can't remember being in show business. I remember I was in show business before I came here. It seems as though I've been here for several weeks. Prior to this appearance, I was in show business, but I can't remember what I did. There's something about Jessica meeting with Lang, you. Jessica Lang. Now I remember. Are we back? Jessica was in King Kong, and people wrote her off pretty, uh, pretty quickly. They made fun of her. And she emerged. You mean you gave it. Jessica her star? No, Is that what you're now claiming? Give, I didn't give her her star. She was in the picture, and I was in the picture. And they made fun of her uh, because she was with this ape, but she emerged to be one of the great eight <laughs> actresses. Uh, the great actresses. So she, uh, had, she was in with an ape, and she was in with you, right? Yeah, she the had same a very version. difficult time. Farrah Fawcett. Farrah is able to move all parts of her body at any time. <laughs> you care to put a quick question? Uh, yes, what possessed you to write your second book? What reason for it? I, I wrote the second book, which comes out in April, it's called How I Get Through Life, and I, I, I felt that I had something to say, nothing that would emerge here, and it's really about how I get through life, and, uh, and there's 80 short chapters about every subject that, that people we would all have in common, and it possessed me to write that. You really believe all those bad things you said about Martin Short on David Letterman? I love Martin Short. He's, he's one, one of my favorite people in the world. Would you say that also about Elliot Kastner? No, I would not. You would not? No. Different category. Yeah, different, different category. Thanks, John Groden, for being our guest. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Talk Live is next on CNBC. <laughs> on the Vietnamese side of the border. Say something. Like what? For headache and acid indigestion. Just